Have you ever signed up for a website that required you to enter a code on the next page that was either texted or emailed to you? This is called two-factor authentication, or 2FA for short, and while it may seem really annoying, it's actually one of the best things you can do to protect your online accounts. In this video, I will explain how it works, how it protects your accounts, which ones are the best, and how to get started using them. Before we jump in, I have just one question for you. Do you find any of these videos valuable or any of the blog posts that I do or the news feed that I run or the podcast that I co-host with TechLore? If so, please consider donating to help keep this project running. I love working on the new oil and I love all of the people that I get to help and meeting other people who are passionate about privacy and security. And I just love everything about it, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and you can help me keep it going. We accept one-time donations, recurring donations. We even have donor rewards. We accept Monero. We accept Bitcoin. We accept Brave. We even have affiliate links if you are planning to purchase another service and want to throw a little bit of money our way. Every little bit helps. Thank you so much. So what is two-factor authentication? Well, it's part of a larger thing called multi-factor authentication. To put it simply, all 2FA is MFA, but not all MFA is 2FA. When you log into a website with your username and password, that is one form of authentication. It is considered something you know, the password in this case, and the username. While this may be sufficient if you use good passwords, as I've discussed in other videos, you can't always rely on that. Sometimes passwords are stored in clear text, or perhaps there's a key logger on your device and those passwords can be scraped. Therefore, there are other forms of authentication that can be added onto that to help verify you. The most common one is known as something you have which is the device where you get these codes, your phone where you get the text message or have the 2FA app, which we'll talk about in a moment. A couple of other common forms of authentication are somewhere you are, which is your location. This is why, especially if you start using a VPN, you'll notice that when you start logging into websites, they'll say, hey, we sent you an email to confirm this login because it came from an unfamiliar IP address. You are not in the usual place and they want to verify that it's you. There's also biometrics, which is called someone you are. These are fingerprints, iris scans, facial recognition, and stuff like that. Personally, I'm not really a fan of the last two. I think that location data should not be a form of authentication because of things like VPNs and spoofing IP addresses. I also don't really encourage the use of biometrics, mostly because a lot of them are stored in third-party systems, and currently there is a huge rash of abuses happening with biometric data being shared without the consent of the people it was collected from. There's also a good argument to be made for the fact that if your password gets breached, you can change your password, but you can't really change your fingerprint. At any rate, this is a topic for another video. Maybe we'll talk about that some other time. So the most common things are something you know, the username and password, and something you have, which is your two-factor. Now, there are different types of something you have. The most common that you're probably familiar with are SMS or email. This is, again, where you get to that second page and it says, we've texted you a code, please enter the code. There's also push notifications. These are becoming a lot more common, especially if you're in the Google ecosystem. If you have an Android phone and you go to log into Google, it might say, hey, we've sent a push notification to your phone, click on the notification to log in. Another common one is software. This would be an app like Authy or Google Authenticator. And the final one is hardware, and this would be a USB token like a YubiKey or an OnlyKey. So how does this work in theory? Warning, this is gonna get a little bit technical. So if you don't care, feel free to skip this part. There are timestamps in the description. If you are interested, but you get confused, feel free to leave a comment or reach out to me with further clarification. There are two types of encryption, and we'll go over this later. There is asymmetric and symmetric. With symmetric encryption, there is only one key, and this is the kind of encryption that you would use where only one person needs access to it. For example, cloud storage or an encrypted backup drive. It's just for you, no one else needs access. Asymmetric encryption is when there are two keys, and this is the kind that is frequently used in encrypted communication. 
I will talk about this more in another video. Two-factor is symmetric encryption. When you enable two-factor and it syncs to your device, whether that's through sending you a text message or having you scan the QR code and then enter the message, it generates a private key and it uses the coordinated universal time or UTC to create that algorithm. UTC is your time zone, basically. UTC plus five, UTC minus seven, things like that. Again, this might sound kind of complicated and it's really hard to explain in a short video. So maybe this is a topic that's best for another video, but yeah, that's the short version is when you scan the code, it creates a private key and synchronizes that with UTC so that your device can work anywhere. If my phone ever loses reception, it can still work as a two-factor device because the key is synchronized. So how does this work in practice? What does this actually look like for the average person? You log into your account and you go to your account settings. Sometimes this is under security, sometimes it's under preferences, sometimes it's called two-step login or things like that. You choose to enable it and it will ask you to sync the device. Again, with SMS, it will ask you for your phone number and text you a code. With push notification, it will usually do so via an app. With software, there's usually a QR code you can scan. And with hardware, it will ask you to push a button that's on the device. In every case, it will ask you to enter the six digit code and that is what will sync them up. Again, with software and hardware options, these work even when you're offline. I believe some push options do as well, but SMS or email will not. This sounds like a lot of work to set up. Why does it matter? Well, according to Microsoft, using two-factor defeats 99.9% .9 of all unauthorized account access. This means that even if your username and password somehow get leaked, they still can't get in without that two-factor code. And depending on which one you use, that's gonna take a lot of resources. And by that point, it might be easier for them just to move on to the next person. So which two-factor should you use? SMS and email are considered the least desirable, SMS especially. SIM swapping attacks are relatively easy. If a criminal really wants to get into your account specifically, SMS is gonna be pretty easy for them to defeat. I would only recommend using SMS if there's no other options available. Any form of two-factor is better than none, but if you have a better option than SMS, you should use it. Push notifications are slightly better, but they're not always common. Software is the sweet spot for most people, the two-factor app. It's gonna be really easy to use. It's gonna be super ubiquitous. There are very few websites that offer two-factor, but do not offer software two-factor. It's very convenient because most people have their phones with them anyways. So yeah, that's gonna be the sweet spot for most people. Hardware is the best you can do. Now, as always, nothing is unhackable. It's important to remember that. But a hardware token is as close to unhackable as you will get. These pretty much require the attacker to be in physical possession of your hardware token in order to get through your defenses. For software apps, there are three that I recommend. The first one is Aegis. It is the most popular and it is available for Android. The second one is And OTP. It is also available for Android. The final one is called Rivo and it is available for iOS. All three of these are open source. The two that are on Android are available on F-Droid, if you're familiar with what that is. And all of them offer the ability to export backups of your two-factor code so that if your device ever breaks, you can easily reload them and be able to continue using them. You should make use of this feature and add your two-factor tokens to your backup routine, which is something we'll talk about in another video. I also want to give an honorable mention to Bitwarden and KeePass. In both of those videos, which I just put out recently, I mentioned that you can store two-factor codes in those password managers. In Bitwarden, this is a premium feature, but once it is enabled, you can simply scan the QR code on your phone, just like any other app. With KeePass, you do have to use a manual token, which a lot of them will give you an option. They'll show you the QR code, and then usually somewhere it'll say, if you can't scan this code, click here. Or sometimes there will just be a random string of letters underneath the QR code or right above it. That is the text version of the QR code, and you can copy that into KeePass and use it as your two-factor vault. This is a very controversial practice to use your password manager as a two-factor vault. 
And I understand why. It creates a single point of failure. If that password vault ever gets leaked, all your two-factor codes and your passwords are out there. You no longer have that two-step verification. I recommend thinking very carefully before you go this route. If the choice is between using your password manager as a two-factor token and not using two-factor, then I would say do it. But regardless, if you do decide to use this feature, make sure that you are heavily protecting your password vault as much as you can. Enable two-factor on that with a different device. For example, maybe use a YubiKey on your Bitwarden to protect it if it has all of your two-factor codes in there as well. Remember, again, you are creating a central point of failure, so it is absolutely critical that you take this really seriously. That's pretty much all there is to two-factor. I mean, it sounds kind of complicated, but it's really not. And it sounds difficult, but quick pro tip, a lot of websites, when you log in with two-factor, there's a little check mark that says, click here to remember this device for 30 days or something like that. And that way you only have to log in with your two-factor once a month instead of every single time. Seriously, when I first made my website, two-factor was listed as my number one recommended action to take. It's really that important. It's on par with good passwords. I know it seems like a lot of work, but it's really not. And the security that you will get in return is immeasurable. Please, please, please do not delay on making use of two-factor. Before I go, I want to remind you that you can help keep the new oil going with a donation. It could be one time, it could be recurring, it could be through regular fiat currency, or it could be through cryptocurrency. It could even be through affiliate links. There are many, many ways to support us. There is a support link in the description below. Please feel free to help us out if you are able. To learn more about two-factor authentication and all of the apps I recommended, as well as some other tips and tricks to get started, check out thenewoil.org.